Hello everyone, I welcome you to the fifth lecture on Samuel Johnson's poem London, a poem in imitation of the third satire of Juvenal. So let's begin. Line number 131 onwards reads, Besides with justice, this discerning age admires their wondrous talents for the stage. Who may they venture on the mimic's art, who play from morn to night a borrowed part? practiced their master's notions to embrace, repeat his maxims and reflect his face. With every wild absurdity comply and view each object with another's eye. To shake with laughter ere the jest they hear, to pour at will the counterfeited tear. And as their patrons hints the cold or heat, to shake in dog days in December sweat. Now, in these lines, what the poet is trying to say is that when he says in this discerning age, he's referring to the times uh, during which he was writing uh, the contemporary time in London. The Londoners, uh, he believes, have only become or have been left only fit for the stage acting. They are only trying to mimic art now. There is no originality left. In this discerning age, admires their wondrous talents for the stage. Well, may they venture on the mimic's art. So art is just being mimicked. It is just being copied or imitated. And there is nothing original or there is nothing new uh, coming from them. Who play from morn to night a borrowed part. They play a borrowed part from morning to night. Practice their master's notion to embrace, repeat his maxims and reflect his face. They repeat expressions. They repeat notions, maxims of these uh, stupid people, he believe, from other countries. And they comply with any and every wild absurdity of their patron. The Englishmen have uh, become so dumb, the poet believes, that they are governed by their patrons. They are governed by uh, those under whose patronship they are. He says that uh, they view each object with another's eye. They are blind followers. They have no opinion of their own. They are not opinionated. They are just blindly following their patrons. To shake with laughter ere they jest, ere the jest they hear. They shake with laughter even before the joke. So that is how they try to comply with their masters. Or to pour at will the counterfeited tear. Or they cry, try to cry falsely. Further he says, And as their patron hints the cold or heat to shake in dog days, in December they sweat. So if their patrons say it is cold, they start shivering even in dog days. Dog days uh, refers to um, the summer season and usually it can coincides, the summer season coincides with the rising of the dog star. That is why the summer season has been called as the dog days. So if the patron says that uh, this, it is cold, they start shivering even in uh, the summer season, which is absurd. Or they start sweating in December when it is actually cold. Line number 144 onwards reads, How when competitors like these contend, can surly virtue hope to fix a friend? Slaves that with serious impudence beguile and lie without a blush, without a smile. Exalt each trifle, every wise adore, your taste in snuff, your judgment in a whore. Can Balbo's eloquence applaud and swear he gropes his breeches with a monarch's air? So the poet believes that when such kind of competitors exist, such kind of people exist in society, how can a man who points out their absurdities fix a friend? Fix a friend referring to have a friend, hope to fix a friend or get a friend. Slaves uh, that with serious impudence beguile and lie without a blush, without a smile. People lie shamelessly. Uh, the trifles are exaggerated, vices are adored, they indulge in uh, vain, they indulge in vain. There are discussions of snuff, that is a form of um, addictive substance, or you can call it as drug also, and whores. So, such a man can applaud Balbo's eloquence 
now balbovia has no special reference to anyone but one can maybe assume that uh, he was probably a stammerer and the next line states and he swears he gropes his breeches with a monarch's air now uh, these words like grope uh, have a sense of indecency and maybe that is what johnson was hinting at the next lines read for arts like these preferred admired caressed they first invade your table and then your breast explore your secrets with insidious art watch the weak are and ransack all the heart then soon your ill placed confidence repay commence your lords and govern or betray so what the poet is trying to say is that people with such arts such cunningness they first invade your table and then they try to win your heart they first invade your table and then your breast breast referring to the heart but as soon as some weak are comes watch the weak are and ransack all the heart as soon as there is some weak moment some weak are when uh, the person or the individual is not on their guard they repay your ill placed confidence referring to uh, the trust by betraying and expressing your secrets this is how they repay they invade the table they invade the heart uh, they gain the confidence of the person and when a weak moment comes they repay by betraying the person commence your lords govern or betray so such men cannot be trusted and these are the people who had infiltrated london line number 158 onwards reads by numbers here from shame or sense of free all crimes are safe but hated poverty this only this the rigid law pursues this only this provokes the snarling muse so uh, what he's trying to say is that majority were free from uh, shame or censor no matter what crimes they commit they were not shameful for it there was no censure there was no restriction all crimes are safe but hated poverty uh, this is something which is not appreciated by the poet that poverty was hated like poor people were despised more than a criminal and this becomes the reason for johnson satire this only this the rigid law pursues this only this provokes the snarling muse snarling muse is a direct reference to himself the sober trader at a tattered cloak wakes from his dream and labors for a joke with brisker air the silken courtiers gaze and turn the varied taunt a thousand ways of all the griefs that harass the distressed sure the most bitter is a scornful jest fate never wounds more deep the generous heart than when a blockhead's insult points the dart the trader who is sober at a tattered cloak has a tattered cloak uh, for a garment to wear so the traders who are honest uh they are not able to earn enough profit his labor remains unrevered his labor is not taken seriously and what johnson is trying to do is he's trying to point at the divide uh, that was existent between the haves and the have nots between the rich and the poor the with brisker air and the silken courtier's gaze and turn the very taunt a thousand ways these criminals Uh, they are flourishing while the honest people uh, they are becoming more and more poorer day by day now johnson uh, makes personal johnson is very personal over here and uh, he says of all the griefs that the harass that harass the distressed sure the most bitter is a scornful jest people with generous hearts are mocked in london this is what he wants to say fate never wounds more deep the generous heart than when a blockhead insults insult points the dot so those people who are morally upright those people who choose the path of honesty and sincerity uh, they are the ones who are suffering in london people with generous hearts are mocked uh, whereas those uh, who indulge in criminal activities they are flourishing day by day and the honest uh, work being done by the traders is completely 
not given any regard. Has heaven reserved in pity to the poor, no pathless waste or undiscovered shore, no secret island in the boundless main, no peaceful desert yet unclaimed by Spain? So even heaven does not show pity to the poor in London. This is what the poet wants to say. And there is no place for the poor. When he says uh, or when he talks about land unclaimed by Spain, Spain was claiming Georgia from the British and uh, the right to exclude British traders from Central and South America. So Britain was also losing land and its colonies elsewhere and the poor did not have uh, any place, place anywhere. Let us rise, the happy seats explore, and bear oppression's insolence no more. The poem tries to dwell on the crime as well as the political corruption, which has deteriorated the state of people as well as their morale. The poet says, This mournful truth is everywhere confessed. Slow rises worth by poverty depressed. So what he means to say is that worth will rise even if depressed by poverty and this is truth which has been confessed everywhere he further continues and says but here most slow where all are slaves to gold but this happens um, in a very slow manner particularly in london if somebody has worth their rise or the journey is very difficult and full of struggle Everybody is slave to gold. Everything is superficial. Everything can be purchased. Where looks are merchandise and smiles are sold. So people just put on a facade. They are superficial. They do not have substance inside. Where one by bribes, by flattery is implored. The groom retails the flavor of his, sorry, favors of his rod. So everything is, uh, or everything can be purchased with money and uh, worth if a person has if he is in london the worth will rise but it is going to take a lot of hard work and struggle because the society itself had become corrupt but hark the affrighted crowds tumult cries roll through the streets and thunder to the skies raised from some pleasing dream of wealth and power some pompous palace or some blissful bar aghast you start and scarce with a king's sight sustain the approaching fire's tremendous light swift from pursuing horrors take your way and leave your little all to flames a prey in the land of the rich the poor are the only ones who suffer there is no place for the poor and their meager possessions they become a prey p-r-e-y referring to victim to the flames then through the world a wretched vagrant roam for where can starving merit find a home they do not even have a home homeless man poor man is neglected completely neglected in vain your mournful narrative disclose while all neglect and most insult your woes so homeless people are ignored and neglected and uh, their woes w o e s their troubles their problems are insulted because nobody is there to pay attention or pay heed there is no one to listen to their narrative or their story and they are left unattended particularly in London that is what the poet is trying to say so the society had become a very harsh and cruel society towards those who do not have anything in their lives and what little possessions they uh, have in their lives that too is snatched away from them this brings us to the close of lecture 5 thank you